The internet is a vast place. Nearly any question that comes to mind can be answered with a simple keystroke. Any curiosity can be quelled with a simple search term. And yet, when we hit enter and look upon the very answer we sought out to find, many of us experience a very peculiar kind of cognitive dissonance. The answer you sought out is grotesque and disturbing. And yet, you can't look away, and you don't know why. It's almost like coming to grips with our morbid reality is a task fit for no one. This is Mount Fuji, and it's known as the most popular example of a stratovolcano. Stratovolcanoes, also known as composite volcanoes, are conical volcanoes built up by many layers of strata or hardened lava. Unlike shield volcanoes, stratovolcanoes are characterized by a steep profile with a summit crater and periodic intervals of explosive eruptions. Fortunately, Mount Fuji hasn't had its periodic explosive eruption yet, but I can't say the same about another mountain that shares Mount Fuji's name. This mountain, located on the west coast of the United States, was nicknamed Fujisan for its resemblance to the popular mountain found on Honshu Island. This volcano's true name was Mount St. Helens, and its violent explosive eruption began on March 16, 1980. The first sign of activity on Mount St. Helens occurred as a series of small earthquakes. On March 27th, after hundreds of additional earthquakes, the volcano produced its first eruption in over 100 years. Hot lava flashed groundwater into steam, and that steam explosion blasted a 200 to 250 foot wide crater through the volcano's summit ice cap. And over a week, that crater grew to a maximum of 1,300 feet in diameter, with two giant crack systems that crossed the entire summit area. The crater was widened by consistent small explosions that happened at the summit. The explosion intervals were rapid in the beginning, one explosion per hour, but over the course of the week, it became one explosion per day. And once debris built up on the edges of the crater, a massive debris avalanche was triggered. The volcano's northeastern bulge and summit slid away as a huge landslide, and this debris landslide was the largest recorded in Earth's history. This massive landslide cleared Mount St. Helens northern flank, including exposing the dome of lava that was slowly becoming more and more pressurized on that flank. And without the weight of all of that ash and destroyed rock, the pressurized magma dome that was found on the northern flank suddenly depressurized and blasted half of the mountain apart, shooting a plume of ash well over 15 miles into the air. Soon after the massive explosion, hot gas and magma tumbled down the side of the mountain in a pyroclastic flow. All all the trees surrounding the mountain either was buried in ash and rock or set on fire by the superheated gas and lava. And unfortunately, the pyroclastic flow just kept moving well past the uninhabited forest and into small towns and communities that surrounded the mountain. The official death toll is commonly cited as 57, but there are theories out there that at least as high as 60 people were killed by this explosion. But it's in dispute only because these bodies haven't been recovered. Fortunately, at least one person's body was immediately identified and returned back to his family, and that person was David A. Johnson, a volcanologist that 13 hours before his death at the eruption site, he was among the approximately 57 people killed in the eruption, and he was responsible for being one of the first people to report that the explosion was imminent. Unfortunately, he was just too close to the explosion to survive, but his message saved the lives of many, many people. This image of two children taken by their parents posing in front of the eruption was the most eerie of photos that I found whilst researching this eruption because the whereabouts of these children are unknown. The pyroclastic flow extended 185 miles and leveled many homes and destroyed the highway surrounding the mountain. The only thing that we can hope is that they and their parents received news of David A. Johnson's warning and were able to get away from the mountain just in time. Electroconvulsive therapy, or ECT, is a psychiatric treatment where a generalized seizure without muscular convulsions is electrically induced to manage refractory mental disorders. ECT is often used as an intervention for major depressive disorder, mania, and catatonia. The usual course of ECT involves multiple administrations, typically given two or three times per week, until the patient no longer has symptoms. 
When ECT is administered, it's usually administered under anesthesia to prevent any mild muscle convulsions, and usually is only done as a port of last resort, or if there's a high likelihood that the patient would benefit with such a serious treatment plan. But what happens if you were to use electroconvulsive therapy not as therapy, but as a punishment, a way of training someone to behave a certain way and to abandon bad behaviors. The Judge Rotenberg Center, founded in 1971 as the Behavioral Research Institute, is a controversial institution in Canton, Massachusetts for people with developmental disabilities, emotional disorders, and autistic-like behaviors. The Judge Rotenberg Center's Behavior Modification Program uses methods of applied behavior analysis and relies heavily on aversion therapy. The adversives used by JRC include contingent food programs where they would restrict your meals, long-term restraints, sensory deprivation, and GED shocks. GED shocks come from the Graduated Electronic Decelerator. It's a device that delivers powerful electric shocks to the skin and described by the United Nations as torture. This device was created by Matthew Israel to use on people at the Judge Rotenberg Center as part of the institution's behavioral modification program. The GED is based on the Self-Injurious Behavior Inhibiting System, or the SIBIS. The SIBIS delivers a weak skin shock that lasts 0.2 seconds. The JRC used the SIBIS on 29 students between 1988 and 1990, but in some cases, the shock was not powerful enough to produce compliance. Matthew Israel reported that one student was shocked by the SIBIS over 5,000 times in a day without producing a desired change in behavior. So what behaviors were penalized? The behaviors were failing to be neat, wrapping one's foot around the leg of a chair, stopping work for more than 10 seconds, closing one's eyes for more than 5 seconds, minor acts of non-compliance, using the bathroom without permission, urinating on oneself after being refused the right to use the bathroom, and screaming while being shocked. Additionally, a report found that the GED could be programmed to give automated skin shocks in response to targeted behaviors. For example, some students were made to sit on GED seats that would automatically administer skin shocks for the target behavior of standing up, while others wore waist holsters that would administer skin shocks if the student pulled a hand out of the holster and shocks were administered continuously until the target behavior stopped occurring. One interview with a former student named Jennifer Masamba would go on to describe how she would be shocked whilst in the shower. She would be told to hold the GED device outside of the shower curtain, all while shocks were still being administered. She would also go on to explain how students would be shocked throughout the day randomly for behaviors that they did in the morning or the day prior. How many times a day do you think you were shocked? In the beginning, I was shocked every day, and then it got less and less, but then there would be times where I would have like a bad day, I will get it a lot, or when they started putting me on the board and shocking me, I would get like five or ten shocks for just doing one thing. What was that like? That was, that was like being on, underground in hell. Many of the students were full-time residents at JRC, and they would have their own rooms to go to after class time, and many would be woken up at night to shocks. A quote from a former anonymous student would go on to say, It was not explained to me why I got this shock. I was terrified and angry. I was crying, and I kept asking why, and they kept telling me no talking out. After this incident, I really stopped sleeping. Every time I closed my eyes, they would jump open, anticipating that jolt somewhere in my body. Over time, the GED device became more and more powerful, with the theory being that the stronger the shock, the more likely the student would stop misbehaving. This would lead to students who had the GED device strapped to them, developing burns and blisters from the electric shocks. And this would be coupled with other punishments, like movement limitation, where students were strapped to a five-point board or a five-point restraint chair, all while being shocked. This drawing depicts the four-point board being used and the student receiving many, many shocks. Oh, oh, Stop, 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 stop,
In 2002, an autistic teenager from New York City named Andre McCollins was restrained on a four-point board and shocked 31 times over the course of seven hours. The first shock was given after he did not take off his coat when asked, and subsequent shocks were given as punishments for screaming and tensing up while being shocked. In the video, McCollins can be heard screaming and shouting, Someone help me, please! And the JRC staff listed this as major disruptive behavior, for which he was administered another GED shock. Austin McCollins' mother would eventually sue the Judge Rotenberg Center and would receive an undisclosed sum of money. She would then go on to release this video to the public. This would be the first step to eventually banning the GED device, but that wouldn't happen until 12 years later when the FDA, in April of 2014, banned the use of the GED device. The GED was the third medical device ever banned by the FDA in the organization's history. However, the FDA issued an administrative stay in March 2020 that allowed the center to continue using shock on individuals who would need a physician-directed plan. As of today, the Judge Rotenberg Center is still open in Massachusetts and still receiving many students with developmental disorders and autism. And there have been attempts to shut down or limit the JRC at the legislative level that have been made in every legislative session since the late 1980s. However, none have passed due to the combination of lobbying from the JRC and protests from parents who believe that their children benefited from the center's use of the GED device and other behavior adversive tactics. German Wings Flight 9525 was a scheduled international passenger flight from Barcelona El Prat Airport in Spain to Dusseldorf Airport in Germany. The flight was operated by German Wings, a low-cost carrier owned by the German airline Lufthansa. The plane was piloted by Andreas Lubitz, and on March 24, 2015, this would be his last flight. At 9.01 a.m. on March 24th, Flight 9525 took off from Barcelona Airport and was due to arrive in Dusseldorf, Germany by 11.39 Central Eastern Time. But around 10.31 Central Eastern Time, Flight 9525, after crossing the French coast, began to leave its assigned cruising altitude of 38,000 feet, and without approval from the air traffic control, it began to descend rapidly and the descent time from 38,000 feet was 10 minutes. Radar observed an average descent rate of around 3,400 feet per minute. Attempts by the French air traffic control to contact the flight on the assigned radio frequency were not answered. Radio contact was completely lost at 1040 CET. At the time, the aircraft had descended 6,175 feet and crashed in the remote commu of Paradis Hot Boulogne. All 144 passengers and six crew members were killed instantly, and the plane and remains of the passengers and crew were scattered across the French Alps. Now, why did this crash occur? Was there a malfunction in the plane? Was there a terrorist on the plane that was trying to force the plane down? The investigators would soon find out that this plane crash was deliberate, and that the pilot, Andreas Lubitz, was severely depressed and suicidal and chose to kill himself, his crew, and all 144 passengers. Andreas Lubitz was declared unfit for work by his doctor. His suicidal tendencies made him unfit for work, yet he decided to hide this information from his employer and chose to fly on March 24th, 2015. The Lubitz family held a press conference in March of 2017, during which Lubitz's father said that they did not accept the official investigative findings that his son deliberately caused the crash. This was because Lubitz didn't leave behind a suicide note or any evidence that he definitively planned to kill himself in that way. But it didn't matter. At this point, Lufthansa had accepted all responsibility for this horrendous tragedy. They would go on to pay 75,000 euros to the family of every victim, as well as 10,000 euros in pain and suffering compensation to every close relative of a victim. This is Paris Mayo. She's 15 years old, and she's a mother. On the evening of the 23rd of March, 2019, Paris Mayo gave birth to Stanley on the living room floor of her parents' home. She was alone while giving birth, and her baby was born healthy. Her parents were upstairs, and Paris was scared that they would find out that not only she was pregnant, but she also had just given birth. 
So in an attempt to hide this from her parents, she immediately started assaulting Stanley by slamming his head on the floor, fracturing both sides of his skull and leading to a massive brain hemorrhage. She would then abandon the baby on the floor, waiting for Stanley to die, and after two hours she noticed that Stanley was still alive. So Paris decided to pick up a few pieces of cotton wool and shoved it into Stanley's mouth, throat, and neck, forcing him to suffocate. After she killed her newborn son, she put the baby's body in a bin bag and deposited the bin bag on the front doorstep outside of the house before going upstairs to bed. The following morning, she texted her brother, who by then was in the house, this message. When you go outside, can you put the black bag in the bin? It's just full of sick from last night, please. He said that Mayo's mother noticed the bag was unusually heavy and that there were streaks of blood on the doorstep, so she opened it. She suddenly went hysterical and was heard to say, there's a baby in the bag, and immediately knew that it wasn't just any baby, but Paris's baby. Paris's mother would go on to call the paramedics, but there was no signs of life. When the mother looked at the baby's corpse, she told the paramedics that there was cotton coming out of the baby's mouth, and from there, Paris was arrested. It would take four years for her to appear in court, and the prosecutors had this to say. She didn't want the baby. Despite having parents and siblings whom she acknowledges are loving and supportive, and whom she could have turned to for help and advice, she murdered Stanley. The defendant says, on the other hand, that she gave birth suddenly and unexpectedly. She believed the baby was dead. She never intended to kill the baby or seriously injure or harm him, and she made no attempt to conceal the birth. It'll be your task, the jury, having heard the evidence during this lengthy trial, whether the prosecution has satisfied you so you are sure of the defendant's guilt. Cryptography, or cryptology, is ancient Greek for hidden secret, and it's the practice and study of techniques for secure communication in the presence of adversarial behavior. More generally, cryptography is about constructing and analyzing protocols that prevent third parties or the public from reading private messages. Modern cryptology exists at the intersection of the disciplines of mathematics, computer science, information security, electrical engineering, digital signal processing, physics, and others. And with that being said, how would someone who is a high school dropout be able to create a cipher that the FBI to this day cannot crack? On June 30th, 1999, the body of 41-year-old Ricky McCormick was discovered in a cornfield 20 miles outside of St. Louis, Missouri. His body was severely decomposed, and when police officers searched his corpse, they found this. Notes written in a secret code that were immediately handed to the FBI and then immediately stumped them. The two notes found in Ricky McCormick's pockets were written with an unknown code consisting of a jumble of letters and numbers occasionally set off with parentheses, and are believed by the FBI to possibly lead to those responsible for the killing of Ricky. According to members of McCormick's family, Ricky had used encrypted notes as a boy, but none of them knew how to read the code. Ricky's family would go into detail about his background, and things would become even more strange. Born on June 14, 1958, Ricky McCormick seemed to struggle with mental health issues from a young age. The Riverfront Times reports that he stood alone at recess, acted strangely, and told odd stories. McCormick's mother, for her part, came to believe that her son was quote-unquote retarded. By the time McCormick dropped out of high school, he could barely read or write. Lacking a high school degree, McCormick worked a number of menial jobs, usually on a night shift. He subsisted on meager paychecks and disability payments, but in 1992, he got in trouble with the law. At the age of 34, McCormick was charged with statutory SA for having two children with a girl known to his family as Pretty Baby, younger than 14 years old. Though his public defender believed that McCormick was suffering from some mental disease or defect, he was found fit to stand trial. He would only be sentenced to 13 months in prison. Once released, McCormick found a job at a gas station, and around this time, his mental state began to decline. He would begin to act erratically and would eventually go to the emergency room two times for shortness of breath and chest pains. And from then, he disappeared, only to be found partially decomposed and a couple of uncrackable ciphers in his pocket. The FBI, when interviewed about this cipher, would go on to say, It doesn't happen often that we have an unsolved cipher of this length and significance. 
The characters are not random. There are many E's, for example, that could be used as a spacer. There are many characteristics that suggest it could be solved, many patterns. The problem is, we don't know why it's not solvable. The FBI would go on to explain on their site that cracking a code takes four steps, determining the language, the system, the key, and then reconstructing the text. But with McCormick's notes, the FBI could only get to step two. So, in March 2011, the FBI revealed the existence of McCormick's notes to the public and asked for amateur codebreakers for help. Many tips began flooding in, but all of them fell flat. When his family found out about the notes, they were conflicted. When interviewed about the notes and whether or not their son was known to write ciphers, they simply responded with the fact that their son was severely illiterate and incapable of writing code. To this day, the popular theory is that the code was written by someone else, most likely the person responsible for his murder. This is 18-year-old Cameron Robbins, and he had just graduated high school. He was known for being the pitcher on his high school's team, and on Tuesday, May 30th, he and his peers were having a good time on a pirate-themed sunset cruise in the Bahamas. But unfortunately, though, Whilst everyone was having a good time, somebody dared Cameron to jump off of the boat and swim in the open ocean. This kid jumped off! Oh my god! Oh! Oh, oh bye bye! Oh, that's hey, not the the buoy! And the buoy! Yo, this kid's. This kid's off, bro! This moment was recorded and things were fine for a second until Cameron started drifting away from the boat. At this moment, the staff of the boat realized that somebody was overboard and threw a life preserver so that Cameron could tread water until someone could pull him back into the boat. But something incredibly strange happened. Cameron wasn't swimming towards the life preserver. And as time passed, the life preserver kept floating away from him and the cruise ship was pretty far away from Cameron. It would be mere moments before no one could see him anymore. There was a multi-day search for Cameron, but no body was recovered. He was presumed dead after the first day of him being missing, and once the official recovery search was called off, Cameron's family thanked both the Bahamas government and the U.S. Coast Guard for all of their hard work in trying to recover the body of their son. This video of Cameron jumping into the sea has been examined by multiple people online. The online prevailing theory as to why he didn't grab the life preserver was because he was too busy swimming away from a supposed shark. That claim is unconfirmed, but what is known was that it was dark out and that the sea was cold and Cameron simply could have been just disoriented from jumping into cold water and then not being able to see anything around him. The Second Sino-Japanese War, or the War of Resistance, was a military conflict primarily between the Republic of China and the Empire of Japan. The war made up the Chinese theater of the wider Pacific theater of the Second World War. The beginning of the war is conventionally dated to the Marco Polo Bridge incident on July 7, 1937, when a dispute between Japanese and Chinese troops in Beijing escalated into a full-scale invasion. This full-scale war between China and the Empire of Japan is often regarded as the beginning of World War II in Asia, although some scholars consider the European War and the Pacific War to be entirely separate, albeit current. The Second Sino-Japanese War was the largest war in the 20th century and had a total casualty count of 22 million people, with one of those people being a woman named Chang Benhua. Chang Benhua was born in Xiaozheng Village, located in the Unhuai province. Her parents were farmers and she was the third child of a total of four siblings by the same parents and another younger brother by a different mother. When she was in middle school, she received some survival and leadership training with the 1,194th Regiment of the Scouts of China. She actively participated in anti-Japanese resistance activities during World War II, and in late 1937, she would get engaged to a fellow resistance fighter. But unfortunately, in early 1938, her fiancé Liu would be killed in action with Japanese troops. In April 1938, she was captured in combat by a unit under the command of Kochi Yamashita, with the 13th Regiment of the Japanese 6th Division. In captivity, she was tortured by interrogators and essayed by several guards. Several days later, when the Japanese received orders to move to another position, Cheng and her fellow resistance fighters were executed by bayonet. 
years would pass before these photos would be made public. In 1992, Chinese author Fang Jun was a student in Japan, and World War II veteran Isumu Kobayashi was among the members of his host family. Kobayashi had fought together with Yamashita during the war, and the two worked together with Fang with his academic project as an attempt to address their guilt for crimes they had committed in China. Among the materials Yamashita shared with Fang was a photograph that Yamashita had obtained decades prior, and the subject was Cheng Benoit, moments before she was executed. Yamashita noted that her demeanor on the day of her execution made a deep impression in him, and in order to not forget her name, he had written Cheng Benoit, age 24, in the back of the photograph. Years later, on December 25, 2012, the oldest living member of the Cheng household, Cheng Nafu, was given these set of photos, and after framing them, she would bring them to the Cheng family ancestral worshipping hall to symbolize a proper burial for Cheng Benoit. This is William Bashan Bill Berilico. Born March 25, 1927, he was a Canadian hockey player who played his entire National Hockey League career for the Toronto Maple Leafs. In over five seasons, Berilico won the Stanley Cup four times in 1947, 1948, 1949, and 1951. Born in Timmins, Ontario, people knew him as a hardworking kid. Though his skill wasn't impressive statistically, he was still picked up by the Toronto Maple Leafs and was able to win four championships for them. And in 1951, Berilico played brilliantly against the Montreal Canadiens with a great blocked shot. And then Berilico remained in the background until the end of Game 5 at the Maple Leaf Gardens. Berilico would end up finishing Game 5 with an amazing slap shot that won the game for the Toronto Maple Leafs. And to celebrate, Bill decided to go on a fishing trip with a friend. Four months after his game-winning Stanley Cup goal, Berilico simply vanished. In August 1951, when visiting his family in Timmins, he accepted the last-minute invitation by his friend, the local dentist Henry Hudson, to fly with him to Rupert House on James Bay in northern Quebec for his first-ever fishing adventure. When Berilico's mother, Faye, learned of his trip that would start on a Friday, August 24th, she pleaded with him not to go. She was superstitious. Just five years prior, Berilico's father died on a Friday, and she just didn't want her son to go on such a dangerous trip on what she considered an unlucky day. When interviewed about his disappearance, she would go on to say, I had a premonition something would happen. And unfortunately, something did. When the two men didn't return that weekend, the Royal Canadian Air Force quickly organized a search that included dozens of planes and more than 150 searchers. At first, Northern pilots weren't worried because Hudson was an experienced pilot who had taken many flights into the James Bay area on hunting and fishing trips. He knew the bush well. However, they searched for two months and covered more than 78,000 square kilometers at an altitude of 500 feet. As the leader of the rescue mission noted, it was like practically looking under every twig. After more than two months of searching, there was no sign of a missing plane, and the search was called off. The total cost of the search was 385,000 Canadian dollars, or in today's money, 3.7 million dollars, which made this search the costliest air rescue in Canadian military history. In 1962, the plane was found only 75 miles from his home when a helicopter spotted glinting metal among the thick black spruce trees. On June 6, searchers dug their way through two kilometers of dense bush to find the plane, and after swamp water was partially drained, two skeletons were found twisted up in the metal of the aircraft. There was also remains of fish that they had caught and stored in the smashed platoon. During the crash, both of the plane's wings were sheared off. The skeletons were still strapped in their seatbelts. It was obvious the two men had been killed on impact. Berilico was 24 at the time of his death. Kamikaze translates to divine wind or spirit wind. They were a special Japanese attack unit of military aviators who flew suicide attacks for the Japanese Empire against Allied naval vessels in closing stages of the Pacific Campaign of World War II. Kamikaze air attacks were intended to destroy warships more effectively than conventional air attacks. About 3,800 Kamikaze pilots died during the war, and more than 7,000 naval personnel were killed by Kamikaze attacks. These aircraft were essentially pilot-guided explosive missiles, purpose-built or converted from conventional aircraft. Pilots would attempt to crash their aircraft into enemy ships in what was called a body attack, an aircraft loaded with bombs, torpedoes, and other explosives. 
only about 19% of kamikaze attacks were successful, and this boy was one of the 19%. His name was Araki Yukio. He was born on March 10, 1928, in the Gunma Prefecture. At the age of 15, he joined the Imperial Japanese Army's Air Services Youth Pilot Training Program. In or around September 1943, he began training at the Takarai Air Base. After he graduated, he started working at the Metabaru Airfield. And in 1944, he got work at the Heijo, now known as Pyongyang, Korea. On May 27, 1945, Iraqi took off from the Bensai Airfield. This would be his one and only kamikaze mission. This photo shows Corporal Yukio Araki, age 17 years old, holding a puppy with four other young men. They were all a part of the 72nd Sinbu Corps, and this photo was taken right before the Kamikaze mission. He was flying a KI-54 twin-engine training aircraft, and it's been suspected that his plane was one of the two that struck the destroyer USS Brienne, killing 66 of its crew. However, the ship did not sink. After his Kamikaze mission, his parents found something that was left for them. Letters written by Yukio Araki, knowing that this mission was almost certainly going to be his last. He had written to his parents and his siblings. During his last trip home on April 5th, 1945, Araki left with his family three letters to be opened when they found out about his death. Here's the first letter to his parents. Dear father and mother, I trust you and my brothers are doing well recently. It has been decided at last I will go take part in the Battle of Okinawa as a member of the Special Attack Forces. I am deeply moved. I only look forward to sinking a ship with a single blow. When I look back, I apologize for not being devoted to you in any way for some 10 years to this day. Though teaching by various senior officers after I have entered the army, I now devote myself to my country as a Special Attack Force member. Please find pleasure in your desire for my loyalty to the Emperor and devotion to parents. I have no regrets. I just go forward on my path. I ask you, teach my three younger brothers so that they can serve our country as noble airmen. I sincerely hope you take good care of yourselves and make strenuous efforts on the home front. Please give my regards to all of my relatives and to everyone in the Neighborhood Association. Farewell, Yukio Araki, 72nd Shinbu Squadron. The second letter was to his older brother, Sichi. Dear older brother, I want to give my thanks to you for taking care of me for a long time. I go to die with no regrets and will earnestly make a hit. I apologize that up to now I have not been able to repay you in any way for your kindness to me. Please be glad that this dispatch to the front will be my repayment to you. Today, as the war situation is becoming more and more intense, it is necessary for me to crash my 18-year-old body into the enemy. This year, you will also enter the military, and I sincerely expect that you will exert yourself with hard work and devoted military service. I have something to ask you and our parents. I especially would like that you give a good education to our three younger brothers, and that in the future, they follow after me as fine Japanese men. Let's meet under Kudan's flowers, Yukio. His final letter was to his three younger brothers. Dear Yasuyoshi, Yoshio, and Kunatasu, study very hard and eat plenty of food. Do not hesitate with food rations. You will not grow if you do not eat. Please do what your parents say and become good Japanese men. You must not be content to accomplish little in life. Do not be proud with small successes and do your best in everything. Remember Todayami Hideyoshi. From long ago, failure has been the foundation of success. Your older brother. What's up everyone, it's your boy Aileris, aka Panda Daddy, and I hope you enjoyed today's video. And if you did, let me know in the comments down below, and leave a like if you liked the video. And if you're new to my channel, go ahead and subscribe fam, what you doing watching videos, and not subscribing. And if you're old, make sure you hit that bell so you can get these notifications every time. I really hope you guys are enjoying the Morbid Reality series. The last two videos were absolutely demolished by the algorithm, so I'm sorry if you guys didn't get that notification. So if you haven't seen those videos and you're recommended, they're linked in the description and in the pinned comment for you to enjoy. And as always, Always, we gotta thank the Patreon supporters that make content like this possible. A big thank you to Jacob Allen, Sherry Morrison, Tron Destroy 23, The Eggs One, Fitz Chivalry, Din Corda, Code Connor Purvis, Aileris's Mom, The Clan, S16. 
Green Pasta Man, Squish, Rinhex, Mr. Bean, My Golden Experience, James Tucker, Lucas Adams, Big Boy Bailey, BMX30, Cinnamon Sticks, Scott, The Fake Musician, Buckethead, Samantha Bellhart, Abin Fanneker, Zach F., Bloody Hunter, Keeley, Dundernass Hawk, Lady Laughs A Lot, Swiss Patreon user, Noah, and Catherine Taylor. Thank you so much for your support. It is greatly appreciated. And if you want to help support the channel, there's two links in the description, one of my merch store and one of my Patreon. Both funds go directly into the channel so we can maintain what's happening here. And as always, stay zesty.